Egypt's first democratically elected president is overthrown just a year after taking office. I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, the situation in Cairo and the response from the U.S. And I'm Peggy Pico. You know it's wrong to give alcohol to minors, but we'll tell you how a local law also holds the host of a party responsible for underage drinking. Then, called the bloodiest fight of the Civil War on the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Battle, we learn of a war hero who changed emergency medicine on and off the battlefield. How his inventions help us today. And imagine wearing tiny little telescopes right over your eyes. Local scientists are working on special contact lenses. Someday they could help people dealing with vision loss. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. President Obama has ordered a review of USA to Egypt after the military there ousted President Mohamed Morsi today. We hear what led up to today's events from Tracy Brown of the Associated Press. With millions taking to the streets protesting against the nation's Islamist President Mohamed Morsi, Egypt's military took to the airwaves. We will freeze the Constitution temporarily. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Constitutional Court will be sworn in in front of the General Assembly of the Court. Cheers erupted among the millions of protesters who were demanding Morsi's ouster. It was the fourth day of the biggest anti-government rallies ever seen in the country, surpassing even those against Morsi's predecessor, Hosni Mubarak. The military's actions, replacing Morsi with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Constitutional Court, calling for early elections and suspending the Islamist-backed constitution were immediately called a full coup by Morsi. The army had hoped the government would be more inclusive, but after the, uh, the speech given by the president yesterday, they thought that the president and government were not paying enough attention to um, popular demand. The situation in the streets is far from clear. Morsi's Islamist supporters have vowed to resist what they call a coup against democracy and have also taken to the streets by the tens of thousands. It is a very, very complicated situation. He does seem to have broken a compact, if you will, with the, the people of Egypt. For the second time in two and a half years of political upheaval, the powerful army appears to be in control. But this time, ousting Egypt's first democratically elected president, making the move potentially explosive. The U.S. is appealing for calm. Right. We're not taking sides in this. This is for the Egyptian people uh, and all sides to uh, work through together, and we're hopeful that uh, they can come to a political resolution. At least 39 people have been killed in clashes since Sunday, raising fears of further bloodshed. Tracy Brown, Associated Press. PBS NewsHour will have more on the situation in Egypt at 7 o'clock. Governor Jerry Brown will turn to the U.S. Supreme Court to try to delay the release of nearly 10,000 prison inmates by the end of this year. Today, a panel of federal judges denied Brown's request, saying California has a history of noncompliance in the long-running case. The state's been ordered to reduce its overcrowded prison population to improve medical care for inmates. Brown says releasing more inmates would endanger public safety. Some downed power lines sparked a brush fire in Chula Vista. It happened this afternoon on the city's southern end. Near the Sleep Train Amphitheater and the Aquatica Water Park, power was knocked out for a while, shutting the park down temporarily. The fire burned about 25 acres before firefighters put it out. Another fire is still burning in the East County. Full containment of the Monte Fire is expected tomorrow night. It's burned about 100 acres since it started Tuesday. The cause still under investigation. Southern California freeways may not be as busy tomorrow as they were last 4th of July. The Auto Club is predicting a slight drop in holiday driving for those who do get behind the wheel. San Diego is the top destination, followed by San Francisco, Las Vegas, the Grand Canyon, and the Central Coast. A little-known county ordinance makes it illegal to provide an environment for underage drinkers, regardless of where the party occurs. Peggy Pico explains the consequences of breaking the law. Half of California's 15-year-olds who drank alcohol last year said they did so at home. But did you know there's a special law about that? 
Most don't. According to a report by county health officials, 17 cities and San Diego County have enacted social host ordinances, but nearly 70% of those people asked weren't aware of those laws. Here to explain the social host law, how it's enforced, and what happens if you ignore it are Assistant Sheriff Patricia Duke and nurse researcher Beth Seiss, both with the County Alcohol Policy Panel. Welcome. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, Patricia, let's start with you. How does these social host laws differ from the law about serving uh, mm -hmm. underage kids drinks? Well, state law prohibits uh, possession, consuming alcohol for, if you're under the age of 21. Um, social host is, is in some sense an extension to that, but it, it holds, it, the responsibility is on the host of a party in a private setting. So it extends that you, it's illegal to drink under the age of 21, but it extends it into the, the privacy of your home. Who's responsible right. for it? So this, uh, who's considered a social host? Is it the person uh, serving the alcohol, the, per the owner of the property, the parents who would qualify as a social host? It could be any of those. It could be the parent, it could be the adult that, that is throwing the party that's hosting the party. But you don't have to be uh, 21, correct? You could be uh, 18 and be considered a, a social host yes. under this. Yes, you could, because you're how, an adult. How, how does that work? Well, you're still responsible. You're an adult, and if you host a party and you're over the age of 18, you're going to be held responsible. Okay, and Beth, let's talk about, um, you are the director of the trauma uh, research over at Scripps Mercy Hospital. Parents often argue, well, I'm taking away their keys. This is a very, I'm providing my teens a safe place to drink. How would you uh, answer that argument? Uh, that's a myth. Uh, there is no place that is safe for underage drinking. Uh, we know that underage drinking uh, occurs, of course, and then sadly, when it does, there's lots of binge drinking that goes on. And this kind of behavior is linked to uh, inherently dangerous outcomes. Uh, unplanned sexual activity, increased uh, suicides, homicides, assaults, this kind of thing. And I think you mentioned um, a, there was some uh, something in regards to how many parties, like the, the, the teens feel more comfortable at home, so the alcohol poisoning is a, a bigger issue. Well, as I said, they do, they're new at the job and they drink heavily and uh, it doesn't take much to then t take too much and of alcohol poisoning, and unfortunately, unless you get yourself to an emergency room, you could die. Okay, let's make this very real life, and right now, uh, Patricia, there's a July 4th party. There's teens there. Mm -hmm. There may or may not be alcohol there. The police is called. How do you go about enforcing this law? Do they go looking for alcohol? What happens? Walk us through that. Well, typically, we're not in there to invade on somebody's home party, and we want people to enjoy the, the holidays, but we want them to be safe. Um, when we get called typically on a social host violation type call that we receive, it's usually a noise call. And when we respond, in, and typically it's very obvious. Uh, you can look and you see a lot of underage drinking. You see some behaviors. Uh, you see folks that are passed out. You see uh, folks that are vomiting. Um, th that's what I really want you to understand. Is that we're not, the Sheriff's Department isn't out there to interrupt a, a, a healthy backyard barbecue party. Yeah, you're not on the prowl, but if exactly. you're called one and you see it, you're going uh, to handle it. Yes, and we're going to handle it, and we're going to enforce it. And we're aggressively enforcing social host. Uh, we feel it's needed, and we're going to hold people accountable. And in fact, we're going to arrest. Social host vi violators will be arrested. Yeah, that brings me to the penalties. So what are the penalties? You can be arrested, even if you're 18 uh, or adult above. What else? What are the penalties if for this? If you knew or should have known that the party was in place and that alcohol was being served or consumed by somebody under the age of 21, you can either be cited or arrested. Like I said earlier, we're going to arrest. The fine up to $1,000, up to six months in jail, and then a cost recovery, you'll be billed for the services, the, the cost of us to respond to the, the party. So costly all the way around. Um, Beth, I think I'm going to end with this. There are some reasonable steps that have uh, been developed that a host can take to prevent underage drinking. Can you uh, tell us about some of those reasonable steps? Yes, and these are written into the law as an expectation. You can control the access to the alcohol of the minors. Uh, you can control the amount of liquor that's being served at the party, pick other alternatives, for example, don't serve too much. You need to check the IDs, you need to verify the age of these young people and make sure that they don't have access, and then finally supervise and monitor so that access is not, uh, they can't access the alcohol. 
All right. Thank you both so much. I want to yeah. let people know that uh, there's a whole lot of more information on this and links uh, mm -hmm. to the sheriff's website. So before that July 4th party, that people can check mm -hmm. it out on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. If you wanted to get married without an appointment, today was your lucky day. It was the first walk-in wedding Wednesday at the city clerk's office downtown. KPBS Metro reporter Sandy Dirk says San Diego is trying to meet the high demand triggered by the reversal of California's ban on same-sex marriage. A steady stream of couples clutched hands and bouquets outside the city clerk's office today. It's now possible for all these couples to be married here, including same-sex couples under state and federal law. And on any given Wednesday through the end of September, it's as easy as showing up. Newlyweds Catalina and Zara Doddridge say when the Supreme Court decision came down, they jumped into action. Woo! <laughs> and I, is this really happening? I didn't believe it. <laughs> and I was like, who do we call? What do we do? <laughs> How do we get a license? Getting hitched quickly was important to the couple. Catalina is carrying their second child. It was extremely important because, you know, when Thomas is born, we could tell him our journey, how we had to wait and, you know, keep watching the news and see if it would happen. And now that he's going to be born to, you know, his two mommies are married. And you've been married five minutes now? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Officially, like five yes. minutes married. Happily married. <laughs> Cynthia Dirks, KPBS News. Dozens of San Diego service members will celebrate their first Independence Day as U.S. citizens. They were naturalized today. In the ceremony aboard the USS Midway, 57 men and women from 29 countries took the oath. Most came from Mexico and the Philippines. An opportunity to double your money with an investment is, uh, is pretty rare these days, but if you step up to support the new San Diego Central Library, a matching grant will increase your contribution twofold. Qualcomm co-founder Erwin Jacobs and his wife will match library donations up to $10 million. The library is currently $15 million shy of necessary funds. The grant could bring the library out of the red and provide a $5 million surplus to fund programs. And the way this match works is if someone's interested in, let's say, a $10,000 opportunity with their $5,000 gift and this generous match from, from the Jacobs, they now will have an opportunity to do that. The Jacobs will match donations until September 28th. By the way, the Jacobs are supporters of KPBS. One, anyone who's used a computer has most likely used one of these, a mouse. The man who actually invented the computer mouse died today. Doug Engelbart also helped develop early versions of email, word processing programs, and the Internet. But the mouse was his big breakthrough, developed in the 1960s. Back then, it was just a wooden shell covering two metal wheels. Engelbart was 88. Imagine tiny little telescopes, thinner than a dime, that fit right over your eyes. UC San Diego's Joseph Ford says that's basically what he and his colleagues have built. Their contact lenses can magnify a user's field of vision by almost three times, and if clinical trials go smoothly, they could potentially help millions of people suffering from age-related macular degeneration. Ford says contacts would be less invasive than current treatments. Right now, people with this type of vision loss often get what's called an implantable miniature telescope. So it's really a permanent surgical implant of a telescope. Um, our, our telescopes may work better than that uh, and provide a brighter image, but more importantly, you can, first of all, switch it on and off, and secondly, take it out when, if you want to stop using it. So the contact lens approach is, is promising. But the lenses need some work. They still provide a pretty fuzzy image, and they need to allow more oxygen to get to the eye for anyone to wear them for more than an hour at a time. David Wagner, KPBS News. Science is also giving us a new view of the Battle of Gettysburg. Michael Rubenkamp shows us how an interactive online map is letting researchers see the battle the way commanders saw it 150 years ago. The Battle of Gettysburg has been studied endlessly from just about every angle. I love this historical map, the 1874 map of Gettysburg. Now researchers are retracing history with modern technology. Our goal is to help people understand 
how and why commanders made their decisions at key moments of the battle. They're using right. software called GIS, or Geographic Information Systems, to create the most realistic representation of the Civil War's bloodiest conflict. So the town of Gettysburg here, and the hills south of town is where the Union Army was encamped. An interactive panorama that reflects what the fighting really looked like through the eyes of commanders like Confederate General Robert E. Lee. So we could use GIS to answer the question, what could Lee see and what could he not see? The answer may better explain the Confederates' dramatic defeat. Civil War historian Alan Gelzo says Lee used this cupola on the Gettysburg College campus to size up the battlefield. But a lovely view all the way around. But GIS mapping confirms the view prevented Lee from seeing Union soldiers massing just out of sight, ready to fend off the Confederate onslaught. The dips and folds of the ground, the foliage as it was on the ground in various groves and woods, all of that concealed what turned out to be the deadly truth. The interactive map was developed for the Smithsonian Institution to mark Gettysburg's 150th anniversary. On the Smithsonian website, it gives history buffs a general's view of the Civil War's pivotal battle. Michael Rubenkam, Associated Press. One legacy of the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, new standards in emergency medicine. Peggy Pico talks with the San Diego author of a new book about the man who set those standards. On July 4, 1863, the Confederate Army retreated after a three-day battle at Gettysburg. Considered the bloodiest fight of the Civil War with 50,000 dead and wounded soldiers, many books recount that battle. Now a new book called Surgeon in Blue remembers one Civil War hero considered the father of modern ambulance service and other battlefield medical treatments. Joining me is the author and spokesman for the USS Midway Museum, Scott Maga. Thank you for uh, joining us. A pleasure. Thanks. Now, this surgeon, Surgeon mm -hmm. Jonathan Letterman, what was it about him that made you want to write this book? Frankly, his anonymity. Uh, he was a military outpost surgeon, suddenly in charge of a 100,000-man army. Uh, in 10 months, during some of the most bloodiest battles of the war, he completely revolutionized battlefield medicine, uh, combat evacuation medicine, in a way that le its legacy translates to uh, survival today. Uh, very little was known about him. No biography had been written about him. And I think his legacy is something that needs to be preserved. And before we get into how it really relates to us today, because it does, anybody sure. in the medical profession probably might be aware of him. Um, I have to say, that what take us back to if you were an injured soldier in the early days of the Civil War, what, what happened? What, what would happen if you were uh, shot and on the battlefield and wounded? Next to nothing. You know, at Bull Run, thousands of wounded soldiers laid on the battlefield for almost a week before they were finally evacuated. Those who were the ambulatory walking wounded uh, wandered the streets of Washington looking for a hospital bed. There was no ambulance service. It was uh, slackers and derelicts and band, army band members who were assigned to evacuate off the battlefield. It was haphazard. It was disorganized. They were untrained. Far more men died uh, as a result of their wounds because of that kind of negligence than directly from enemy fire. Sure, laying on the battlefield Absolutely. for three days with no food and water. Middle of the summer. Um, tell us what Letterman changed uh, specifically when you talk about these ambulance services and getting people to the hospital. Well, Letterman was a master organizer combined with a great deal of compassion. He recognized that, number one, men had to get off the battlefield quickly, and not just off the battlefield through an organized professional ambulance service, but there had to be organized aid stations and field hospitals and a sense of triage that did not exist at that time. So he put together very, very quickly, only two months before Antietam, a comprehensive system, uh, acquired the authority to implement it so that a soldier not just was evacuated by nightfall, he went to an aid station, there was someone there waiting to take him to a hospital, and he was getting the kind of treatment he needed that he didn't get early in the war. And it was far-reaching because there weren't enough hospitals, certainly, to handle the kind of no. wounded. So they, they were also held in, in farms and people's homes, oh, and absolutely. he would go in and scout these out. Yes, uh, at, uh, at Gettysburg, he identified uh, and assigned more than 100 hospitals. And when we say hospitals, to your point, we're talking about barns, farmhouses, stores, churches, cornfields, if, if necessary. But keeping the men close to battle, close to so they could get care as quickly as possible was key. No one had done that before. And he wasn't just about this emergency triage that we now use today, yes. not just uh, on the field, but off the field. Any ambulance brings a, a patient. Sure. 
to, to the uh, ER, ER, and they're going right. to triage him just as Here he did uh, back in the Civil War. Um, but he was he was about more than that. Tell us about his concerns over the um, soldiers' camps. Well, I tell you, when a soldier went into battle early in the Civil War, the chances were were very good that he was malnourished and sick. Uh, the Army disease rate at that time was 40 percent. The Army diet was salt pork. Uh, weevils in biscuits and alcohol. Uh, he recognized that that could not be tolerated. He also uh, revolutionized diet uh, and nutrition standards for the soldiers. Open latrines no longer could be near kitchens. Uh, Lice-infected uniforms were now burned and, and changed regularly. So he looked at it from a holistic standpoint, recognizing that if he could produce a healthy army, uh, it would be a more effective army and perhaps even bring the war to a close a little bit sooner. And it was proven at Gettysburg. Absolutely. So absolutely on this. He was uh, asked to be relieved of his command before the war ended. How come? Uh, actually, he resigned. Uh, after 10 months and three of the war's bloodiest battles, uh, more than 40,000 casualties, wounded men, were under his care. He asked for a transfer shortly after Gettysburg, shortly after he married in his mid-30s, uh, spent a, a year on the outskirts of the war, and then resigned just about the time that his system was enacted as federal law by Congress and made mandatory in every Union Army for the rest of the war. And ultimately, we're out of time, but he burnt out, basically, to put it succinctly, and yes. ended up moving to San Francisco and doing what? Became coroner for two terms, uh, dying tragically at the age of 47. Okay, well, a lot more in your book. Surgeon in Blue, author Scott McGaugh, uh, thank you so much for this timely reminder about a hero in our history. My pleasure. San Diego swimmers and surfers are seeing more of a certain type of underwater predator these days, seven gill sharks. They can grow to 11 feet and they eat just about anything. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson has this update. This is a regular ritual for Rod Watkins. He lugs his diving gear to Scripps Park in La Jolla. This happens to be a crisp, clear morning above the water, and Watkins is hoping for the same below. This is called the regulator. We'll put that on the tank to breathe. <laughs> it's always good to have some way to breathe underwater. Watkins runs Scuba San Diego, and he's dived here for nearly five decades. He says the seven gill sharks used to be scarce here. You'd only see one or two a year. The difference today is we're seeing so many more seven gill sharks that it's kind of phenomenal. And intimidating. Watkins says the sharks effortlessly slide through the water on the ocean floor. They're silent, they're bold, and they're big. The seven gills, they won't move out of the way for anybody. They'll cruise right up to you, right around you. An 11 foot shark gets Watkins adrenaline pumping. He regularly dives at La Jolla Cove, hoping for a close-up look at a creature that is usually the largest predator in local waters. For some divers, it's an irresistible pull. This is a very picturesque scene. It's attractive to people, but it's what you don't see underneath the water that is attractive to the sharks. These sharks tend to like kelp forests, bays, uh, fairly shallow water. Marine biologist John Hyde says there is plenty of food here. The larger sharks feed on seals and sea lions, and both of those animals are common at the cove. Hyde says the sharks thrive in nearshore areas from Alaska to the tip of Baja, California. But until recently, sightings have been infrequent. Their dorsal fin is very far back on their back, so they don't look like your typical shark, where most sharks have a dorsal fin about mid-body. These are further back towards the tail, so they look a lot more prehistoric with this long tail, kind of weirdly placed dorsal fin. Hyde doesn't consider seven gills a threat to people. They haven't bitten anyone in San Diego waters. But he says they are big and are aggressive if provoked. He isn't sure if the local population of seven gills is up or if divers are better at finding them. So we're not sure if there's a change in effort, you know, more people with cameras, more people looking for these sharks that's causing us to, to hear about them more often or whether there actually are more. I think it's a combination of both. Michael Bear had his own close encounter while diving with a friend off Point Loma. I looked over and all of a sudden this magnificent nine foot seven gill swam right between us. I mean, it was just like, like that, like two feet away. I could have reached out and touched it. Bear hopes to find out more about seven gill sharks. He set up a web page and is urging local divers to upload pictures, information about encounters and videos. This is a female seven gill taken in very shallow water uh, a couple years ago off of Point Loma. And as you can see, she came very close to the divers. Bear considers himself a citizen scientist. 
He is diligently collecting information in an effort to understand the species. A broad nose seven gill shark. Bear would like to know how many seven gill sharks live here, and he's interested in identifying the seven gills who've been photographed and filmed. We hope in the in the years coming to be able to identify individual seven gill sharks with the unique freckling pattern on their bodies. Pattern recognition software might help with that. Meanwhile, Bear continues to collect, document, and organize the underwater encounters. And as you can see, they're very unperturbed by divers. They just keep doing their thing. They just cruise by. That's a close encounter. That is a very close encounter. That's a male. So far, he's gathered 50 videos and more than 150 photos. He's hoping to spark interest in the local marine research community so more will be known about a prehistoric creature that is thriving in San Diego's nearshore habitat. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. And tonight's stories are online at kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.